Felicitations! It is me, Felicia Day. This is my podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is now March. It is March, which means that uh, 2020 is almost a fourth over. Okay, I just scared a lot of people. It's a sixth over. We're going to be a fourth over at the end of the month. And then at the end of April, we're a third over. So I am scaring you, aren't I? Okay, I'm sorry. It just started. It's New Year. Happy New Year! Oh, anyway, it's been uh, a couple weeks, as it, as always, for felicitations. And I want to give a shout out to my book. If you guys haven't picked up my book, Embrace Your Weird, Face Your Fears, and Unleash Free Creativity. Um, I hope you guys have picked it up. Lots of people have been sending me lots of messages all weeks, all weeks, all of the weeks, saying how much they're enjoying it. I'm getting a lot of really funny pictures of drawings people are doing in it. And it just, I don't know, it just makes my day whenever I see someone enjoying the book. A lot of book clubs are picking it, which I want to give a shout out to all those people out there who are enjoying it together with other people. Hopefully you're getting something valuable out of it and discussing it with other people. Um, another shout out to the Wikia that Sean Sandaluki Look uh, maintains for this wonderful podcast. Uh, felicitations.fandom.com. It is uh, a comprehensive experience. If you would like to hear anything that we've done here and uh, felicitations, any of the books that I've mentioned, any of that, uh, Sean Sandaluki Look does the show notes and is amazing. So thank you, Sean. And as always, everyone come to the Discord, discord.gg slash Felicia Day. Okay, so uh, it's been a busy couple weeks. Like I said, um, construction is going well on my back office. It is completely torn asunder. They've been digging ditches around it, I guess for the footings. And I got inspected. It is uh, okay, A-okay. So they're going to start pouring concrete, which I'm going to miss because I'm going out of town for an acting job for about a week. And then I'll be back and I'll have concrete. It's going to rain. So it's going to be, it's going to be annoying because I didn't want them to put up the framing and stuff when the ra- it would get rained on because I don't want mold. But it's like, how can I stop rain? They can't tent the whole thing. So I guess we'll just like, hey, wood dries out, right? I mean, trees get dry at a certain point. So I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know if this happened last time, but I was, um, as I've mentioned, I've been working on a writing project. I'm sorry, I'm very getting over a little cold, but I'm I don't have coronavirus. I promise. I am I am eerily not worried about it, and I know that's the privilege of not being someone who's immunocompromised. So I want to give a shout out to anyone who is justifiably afraid, because um, somebody who is older or has any kind of uh, vulnerabilities with their immune system um, is are very afraid. Um, but uh, for me, my dad is a doctor. So unless things are hanging off by literally a thread and they're bleeding out, you know, I'm not that concerned about it. Um, but people are very hysterical about it. So rightly so sometimes and rightly maybe overreacting. I don't know. I, I'm just not caught up in the craze of it yet, but I'm sure I'll get there because um, I'm a really good hypochondriac. I don't, I'm kind of disappointed in myself, to be honest with you. <laughs> um so yeah, with the construction thing going on, I uh, I finished my writing project that I've been working on for a solid six months. I didn't finish it. I turned in a first draft. So we'll see what uh, feedback I got. And uh, I'm hoping that it'll be out this summer. So if it doesn't, I don't know what I'll do. I have felt like I've been in a holding pattern for like two years of my life. And, um, and turning it in was a big accomplishment. And then I got depressed. I know if anybody has been working on really big projects in their um, in their life, sorry, I'm popping my peas. I need to get one of those little screens. Sorry. Um, yeah, if anybody's ever done a really intense project, they've been working on a long time, just totally all encompassing, and then it, it kind of ends for a little bit or over forever, it is a big letdown. And I've seen this in a lot of my friends when their shows wrap. Um, I know when Supernatural's over, I really sympathize with Jen- Jared and Jensen because I can't imagine being... 15 years on a show and then just like, okay, it's over. Um, the great thing about that show is I know everyone's going to remain friends, especially the crew. I mean, they are so tight with the crew. They're going to be friends forever. So, you know, that's the fun thing about, um, you know, film and TV. You're with people an intense amount of time, crazy hours, and inevitably you're going to form a friendship or two that lasts a lifetime, which is really nice. So, uh, yeah, but, um, let me think. So I turned in the writing project and I got really super depressed. And I was just like, what do I do with my life? I feel like I've been, you know, in a cave for months and I'm popping my head out and I'm like, whoa, what happened here? 
Um, I haven't been doing an audition because I've just been focusing on this writing. And so now I'm kind of figuring out my next stuff. Thank goodness I have this acting job that's coming up and it's sending me away and I'll come back next week and I'll just hit the ground running. Um, I, you guys, I, I, I don't mean to be so negative on this podcast. A lot of great things happened to me. I sold something a couple weeks ago to a Hollywood person who knows if it'll ever get made, but I did sell it, which is a big accomplishment. But in the last two weeks, I've had three other things get rejected. And one of them I've worked on for like 18 months. So it has been a tough couple weeks. I have to say I'm, you know, sometimes I'm okay. I'm just like, get up and go, Felicia. It's okay. This is, I'm in the business of rejection. And then some weeks I'm just like, why don't I just move to Spain and stream video games for a profession? <laughs> um, one thing I have come out, one thing is ha- that has has come out of this recent like sort of downturn t- is um, um, I do need to kind of work on my, you know, work on my anxiety levels, which I'm um, actually taking some medication for. I'm, I'm have a small dose of Lexapro that the doctor put me on. I've, I've done that for the last couple of weeks. And I have to say, I think it's finally kicking in and I'm now finally sleeping, um, for without like waking up in panic attacks all night. So I actually feel like, you know, maybe this was the move I needed to make a while ago, but you know, you ever, you get around to whatever you get around to. Um, we'll see how I have been kind of like, low energy and low motivation. So I don't know if, you know, I can stay with it, but I'm proud of myself for going to another doctor and like just trying something new because I was kind of scared about it. I didn't know if my creativity would get affected. I think, um, you know, all I needed was um, some some real sleep. And I think just the last couple of weeks, my head has cleared up, up, up a lot. It also has taught me that I really miss digital content. I really miss making stuff on a constant basis. I miss being out there and being creative. Um, So I'm really focusing on how I can do that in a small way, in a manageable way that doesn't take away from the other things I'm working on, but is more than just this podcast because I do love the podcast, but I miss being in video, communicating with you guys, making something, editing it. Um, So I don't know what it is. Um, Even if it's just like one YouTube video a week, that might be my goal and I'm just going to figure out how to do that. So um, long story short, I'm like shaking a lot of trees to see what can I do, you know, just to have fun with my friends in a way that I get back to the roots of what gave me joy because Hollywood has never given me joy. Now that I think about it, I was talking about it with my therapist the other day. I'm like, gosh, before I started doing web video, I was a, I was just as depressed as I am now. And she's like, oh, maybe that's a sign. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so... Um, I'm feeling much better about it because I'm feeling like, oh, now I'm targeting like what makes me more happy. So I can't say that it'll be a short term thing, but a long term, that's my goal, guys. Um, The great thing is, though, that next week I'm going to announce an acting thing I'm doing um, that'll be out in April. I'm doing this next this thing this next week, which is super exciting. Um, So things are really looking up and and uh, I'm learning how, you know, I've been doing so much self-care um, I have a B12, I, I went to a, this new doctor and I have a B12 deficiency that's pretty radical. I have a really bad vitamin D deficiency and an iron deficiency, like to the point where he's like, you need to go get shots for the B12. So, um, actually I'm kind of hoping that, um, you know, this new protocol will even help because cutting out caffeine and sugar and some of the herbs I'm on have helped so much. It's just like one thing after another, I'm digging myself out of like, um, a post- you know, baby post company kind of morass. Um, and I'm so happy about it. Like every, I wake up and I'm like, wow, I feel like I'm on the right track, which is really nice. Um, so yeah, it's good. I, I also, you know, kind of come to terms like, um, you know, having a baby and leaving my company. I just announced this week that I, ha- I had left Geek and Sundry and it was a shock to a lot of people. And, you know, the reason why there's a lot of legal reasons I can't go into what happened and why I left and things like that. Um, but you know, I, I didn't realize how traumatic it was to kind of leave all that behind. And it was really, a, uh, I was abandoning like a part of myself and then having a baby come in and sort of shatter that self, uh, sense of self, like it's been a really hard adjustment. And so I, uh, I've been hard on myself in not getting back to where I was, but like now I'm, I'm starting to just be like, Oh, you know what? You needed you needed some t- some space, and now 
my mind is kind of open to new things in a way that it hasn't been ready for before now. So uh, also, I have a radical B12 deficiency. <laughs> I love it. There's a solution. There's maybe a reason. My memory's like, boo. Um, so anyway, uh, last week, uh, or two weeks ago, I also got to do an amazing project. It's uh, Dungeons of Nachelbeck, which is uh, this amazing video game. And I got to do the voice for the wizard. It was uh, five days of recording all day, every day. And she's such a cute character. She's like this know-it-all and she's a know-it-all kind of snarky person. And the cool thing about this project is that I had heard about this project or, or the, the source material of it years ago. I went to France several years ago to promote the Guild DVD in French. And somebody had told me about this Dungeons of Nahalbeck. And it basically started out as a guy in his bedroom recording audio shows about his D&D group in a parody way. And he did all the voices, the girls and the boys. And uh, it was this huge phenomenon in France only from uploading mp3s this was before podcasts you guys and so the underground world found this celebrated it it turned into comic book series that is huge in France uh I think there was you know uh books all sorts of things and now there's this really really funny video game coming out this uh I believe later this summer but I'm not sure exactly the release date but um I got to do the voice of the wizard which was really fun because I love doing voiceover I do a lot of it now. I do a lot of auditions for it. And just like the art form of voiceover, I think is underappreciated in a lot of ways. So, um, and and what was more challenging for this project in particular was that uh, I had to record the translation, the English translation. They had already recorded the French actress doing the French version of The Wizard because they're releasing it in French um, because that's where the biggest fan base probably will be. But, um, so I'm recording the English, but I have to record the English version of the French line in the time exactly that the French actress did. So not only do I have to, you know, act well, record the line, but I have to do it within the time frame. Um, so basically I had to dub over, uh, in the same time frame that the other actress was. And it got a little frustrating. It's like shorter, no longer, a little bit shorter. Okay, let's cut a couple of words out. Okay, try this. So it was a little bit of a, a learning curve. But by the end, I'm like, I am amazing at this. I'm so good. So it was a it was like a crash course in dubbing. Uh, now I want to do some anime. anime. I would love that. Um, so yeah, that was really super fun. And I got to go to PAX East, which was, oh, guys, you know, just walking into PAX East made me nostalgic, but also... Um, excited because just, you know, it's a really special con if you're a gamer. It's not like a signing convention, not like a Comic Con, which is like all media. It's not like a signing one like Dragon Con or, you know, a Wizard World or a Fan Expo or whatever. It's only for games. And they have a huge tabletop section. And I can't even tell you the joy with which I walked through the aisles of the tabletop section. And I bought Calliope a little mimic, um, a little mimic, um, uh, chest that was so cute and she loved it because I have this little book called the APCs, AP, the ABCs of, um, uh, is the ABCs of RPGs. That's not it because that's another book that she loves, but it's another one about, you know, it basically has, uh, D and D characters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And she loves the M for mimic. She loves that character. Uh, she also likes, um, uh, um, uh, she also likes, uh, owl bears a lot. And I did not push her at that bugbears and owlbears. So it's really fun. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a whirlwind trip because I went in Wednesday and I left Thursday night. So um, it was a six hour trip each way. I wish I'd been able to stay, but um, scheduling did not allow me to stay any longer. But it was so fun to just walk around and be like, oh, I, uh, I love this stuff. I love being here. And I miss being here in a business way, but also just as a person, I just love being here. i you know, the Wasteland 3 was there. All these video games were there. It was just so fun. It was just wonderful. Anyway, uh, highly recommended as a con. I saw Rocket Soup and Deceptive Mirror from my mod squad. Hey, guys. Awesome. And it was great. So, yeah, um, that's it. That's my that's my couple weeks. It's been very busy, full of work. So we'll see what happens. And next week I'll be announcing a new thing and be able to talk about that a little bit more. And that'll be exciting. So, Fun times. Um, books I read this week, just to get on with that. Um, the Ninth House by Lee Bardugo, I finally read. It is so good, you guys. I mean, if you read the Grishaverse books that she has, you know that she's an, a spectacular writer. But 
Um, this one is just awesome. And I heard they're already developing it as a TV show at Amazon. And I'm like, I'm in. So that was really fun. Um, let's see. Uh, Wizard of Oz, I read by Frank Baum because Calliope wanted to read it. I got her like a picture book and I was playing some of the songs and I was like, do you want to read the long chapter book? It doesn't have pictures. And she was like, yeah. And we read, guys, the whole Wizard of Oz. She was so patient. And she, you know, we'd read like two or three chapters a night. And it was so fun. It's so well written. And it's so lovely. And it's really written for, you know, her age. I mean, I don't know every three-year-old would sit through a whole Wizard of Oz. But like, um, I think three or four-year-olds, like that level is fine. We tried Alice in Wonderland, however. That is not a three-year-old or four-year-old level. That is much more written on an older kid level. Even me, some of the vocabulary, I was like, huh? Um, it is dense. I did have the annotated version though, and um, I kind of want to read it with the annotation because there's a lot of layers to that and a lot of references. And it was kind of like fan, you know, like in joke fan fiction for the Victorian set. It was very interesting. So that's great. And I finally finished Homeric Moments by Eva Bran, who was a professor of uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And it is sometimes dense, but like there's some fascinating stuff in there that I. I literally just ate it up, guys. I think I'm kind of coming off my Greek and, you know, Roman obsession, but um, I'm still kind of like, now I kind of want to read, reread the Odyssey, having read the book about the Odyssey. I probably won't. But anyway, um, the two books that I have, I'm going to be traveling for the next week. And the two books I have on my Kindle to read are Last of the Amazons by Stephen Pressman which is basically set in ancient Greece, but it's about the Amazonian tribe of all women. And I guess it's, um, you know, the fictionalized version of, you know, the source material, which was fiction, but not really because they found like uh, burial sites with women um, warriors and stuff in the East, like around in Turkey and stuff like that. So it's really fascinating. Um, So I'm excited about that. And then Aaron Morgenstern wrote Night Circus, which um, I read a while ago that I want to reread. And she has a new book called Starless Sea that's out, which is supposed to be magnificent too. So I'm super, super, super excited about that too. Um, so those are the two things I'm super psyched about. And that is it for Felicia updates in Felicia world. I hope I wasn't like too depressing about like, um, I mean, I'm not depressed. I, I was depressed last week, but I'm totally fine now. And I know that it was tied to finishing that project. So I know that about myself when I have a job and it ends, I'm just depressed for several days. And so if you know that, you're kind of just like, okay, I'll just go with it. This is brain chemistry this week. And I have to say that just being able to sleep more functionally without like feeling like, um, you know, waking up in a panic all the time or just like I'm able to watch a little bit more TV without like getting so agitated before bed. Um, I, I still can't have caffeine or sugar, but still it's such an immense uh, relief to get a little bit of medication to help, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm hoping that it, knocking on wood, that it sticks. Anyway, uh, let's do some questions. Dan Tomasik, Tomasik asks, dearest felicitations, do you ever bring your little one to board game nights? Oh, good question, Dan. So I don't get to do a lot of board game nights. Um, I would like to, I, I had some board game days, when she was uh, a little bit smaller on like a weekend and I would bring in, you know, someone to babysit her. And then, you know, sometimes she'd come in and sit in my lap and watch the dice. That was when she was like, you know, under two. Um, I, (laughs) her latest obsession though, okay, the mimic thing is uh, good, but then I got my box of dice out and she is obsessed. She's so obsessed. And I have like a probably a a couple hundred dice in like a, a, a big, you know, plastic tub She loves them so much, you guys. She will spend an hour just sorting them by color and putting them in the little boxes that I had for them. And so when I was at PAX East, I went to um, Level Up Dice, which is some of the most amazing dice I've ever seen. Very pricey, but so gorgeous. I have to say they're worth it. And so I got her this um, this, uh, composite dice that is very large because she wanted a large but light dice and they had this one there it was way overpriced but I don't care it was pink and it was like hand carved and it was from Australia it was so pretty that I bought it for her and it fit perfectly in her mimic box that I got there at at, uh, level up so I have to tell you oh obsessed I mean I didn't buy anything for myself because I blew my budget on her gifts 
But uh, just seeing her face when she opened up that mimic box and saw that pink dye in there, oh, guys. And so the game that we play now is that um, I will roll, so I'll, she'll be like, let's do a dice story, okay? So what I do with her now is I will be like, okay, once about a time, um, there was a kid named Calliope and uh, and I will ask her what she wants in the story. And I'll, she'll be like, I want a door. And I want a monkey, okay? So I'll be like, once upon a time, there's a kid named uh, Calliope, and she was walking down the hallway one day, and in the bathtub, there was a mysterious door. And I'm like, what do you do? And she's like, I open the door. And I'm like, you have to roll. And so I give her her big dice, and she rolls. And then I'm like, is that above 10 or below 10? And she looks at the number, and she's like, above. And I'm like, that's right. And so you try to open the door, and it opens perfectly. And so basically, I kind of like DM her through an adventure only using the dice as sort of like a skill check, right? And above 10 and below 10. And so she's learning all the numbers above 10 and below 10. And she's like so excited. She loves it so much. And so you'll she'll try to cheat. Like if she rolls a two, she'll literally deliberately re-roll. And I'm like, well, okay, you try. And so, and I try not to make it a failure. I just am like, okay, uh-oh, it's under 10. A problem came up and I'll give her a problem that I give her, you know, the ability to overcome. If it's a one, I'm like the biggest problem happened. And if, if she rolls a 20, um, I give her something really special that happens. And at the end, inevitably, she finds some treasure or some kind of candy. But I don't give her real candy. Anyway, it's so fun, you guys. And I don't know if you have little kids, but I feel like at three years old, she's able to do this. I'm like, what are we going to be able to do at five? We're going to be able to do a real dungeon. I'm so excited. I actually bought, um, when I was at PAX East, I bought this um, role-playing game that was based in Jane Austen's time for myself. Um, it's really cool. It has a lot of rules, so I'm still kind of reading through it, but it seems amazing, and I really want to play it somehow. And then there was another, like, really small little role-playing book called, I can't remember the name of it. It's like Princess Dinosaurs, and it's so cute, you guys. It's made for kids, especially, and I would say it's probably a little old for Calliope, but, like, in two years, she totally could play it, and basically, you're a princess dinosaur, and you have, like, um, and it's and it's really nice because it's made to do cooperative play. So if you had two or three kids together, they're encouraged to help each other with their dice and stuff. It's so cute. Um, I will leave the exact name in the show notes. So those are the two things I bought and they're very fun. So Dan, that was a very long answer to your question. Thank you for asking it. Opal LeFay asks, what kind of bag or purse person are you and what sort of things do you carry in it? Opal, this is really great. Um, I... I wish I, I, if I did videos again, I would give you a purse thing, although I would be embarrassed at the dirt. I am the kind of person who never changes their purse until the purse falls apart. I don't understand these women um, who wear a different purse to match their outfit every week. I am not that person. I have purses that I've never used because I just haven't gotten around to using them um, because I'm waiting for the ones up until then to wear out completely. <laughs> so... I have a bigger purse because I carry a lot of stuff. It's a big enough purse I could stick my laptop in it. Um, I got it in uh, Portland. At, at, I can't remember the name of it, but a really nice like local Portland shop. So it's like green leather and it's really nice and it has a side pocket. I have way too many lipsticks in there. I have way too many notepads. I have um, always have some wet wipes because I'm a mom and so usually like a pull up or a diaper just for an emergency. And I have my overstuffed wallet that I never get receipts out of. And I, that's about it. Some concealer sometimes I put in, but I don't, you know, it, oh, 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 and I'll have seven water bottles in there. <laughs> so I'll get to the point where I'm like, oh my God, why is my purse so heavy? And I'm not kidding. There'll be like three or four full water bottles in there. So I recommend cleaning out your purse once in a while. Um, so... I wish I could say there was something more exciting in there. I don't know. I, I Now I carry a 20-sided dice in there just because, you know, luck. Uh, okay. Uh, take the step on Discord asks, Felicia, you have a background as a solo violinist and in a large ensemble. You have mentioned taking voice lessons as well. I'm also a musician with a classical instrument background, tenor trombone, who is now taking voice lessons. What are some differences you have noticed? Has it re reconnected you as a musician? What is your relationship with music now? And is there anything musical you anticipate in your future? Oh, thank you. The, take the step. Um, so I've never really felt comfortable singing. I've always been, and I'm so incredibly tied to expressing myself through the violin. Sometimes I feel like I will never convey the emotion that I'm feeling 
through words or my body as an actor or a vocalist the way that I can the violin. I just, you know, I played it since I was three. It was really my only conduit to really letting my emotions out as a child, to be honest with you, because I just, um, for various childhood reasons, I was kind of somebody who internalized a lot of my emotion. And so um, to me, when I listen to classical music, it's almost too touching, especially not vocal music, but like classical music in general, like it almost touches me too much. Like I will sob at the drop of a hat with classical music, especially violin or cello. And so, um, you know, it was my first language, I think, and I've never been that comfortable using my voice. Um, so to me, it's really, it's a challenge to get the emotion in there. It really is. And I feel like that's something I'm working on in therapy because I'm like, I need to be able to tap into all my emotions. And that's why I do comedy because I don't have to really show, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm playing acting at, at showing emotion rather than feeling it. I, there, I've done a lot of acting in my, in my, his, you know, my, in my career that I'm really proud of that I really let emotion out. But in general, um, you know, there's nothing like playing a note on the violin. I, I, can, I feel like I can convey more there than anything. Not anymore because I'm not in practice, but when I was in practice, it was like that was how I wanted to talk to the world. So um, I, I, I take vo- vocal lessons occasionally sometimes. And whenever I do, I feel like I'm more in touch with my body. I think that that's one amazing thing about vocalization is that um, you have to be in touch with your whole body. You have to be an, a full body athlete to sing. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. Doing that voiceover last week for, um, oh wow, like 20 hours. Uh, or 25 hours was very challenging. The first couple days, you know, I really had to start how to pace myself. I had to like remind myself to talk from my gut versus my throat because, you know, I can't burn my voice out. And so, and I had to be much more careful about what I ate because I didn't want to get acid reflux or like burn my voice out. So, you know, it's, it's very challenging and I admire voiceover artists so much because they just had to be so careful with uh, their voice. Um, Yeah, I don't, my connection with music right now is not what I'd like it to be. I'd like to get back into practice. I'd like to show Calliope that being a musician is so important. And I haven't been doing that with her um, really because every time I got my violin out, she kind of like try to manhandle it. So I think she's old enough now that she'll give me a little distance and I'll be able to hopefully play with her. I don't know if she's a classical person. She seems like more like a skateboarder than a, a ballet dancer. But, you know, whatever she's drawn to, like if it's like she needs to be a rock and roll drummer, I'm like, I'm here for you, baby. Anyway, um, okay, next question. Richard Gagnon asks, I finally ordered some mung beans based on one of your podcast recommendations. Awesome, I'm changing the world one bean at a time. I'm surprised at how small they are. What are some of your go-to quick recipes? Can you put them in the show notes? Okay, well, Richard, I don't have a ton of mung bean recipes. I do have one that I will put in the show notes. It is by at the heynutritionlady.com. It is mung bean and coconut curry. Now, for the record... Um, this recipe that Hey Nutrition Lady has, has nine cloves of garlic. I don't put any garlic in it and it tastes just as good. I always use my homemade chicken stock to make the mung beans. And I think that makes them a lot more flavorful than just water. So I would recommend that if you can make your own chicken stock. Awesome. If you want to just use store-bought chicken stock, I think either one would probably be more flavorful or vegetable broth. Um, if you're a vegetarian, that is an awesome recipe that is really great. And, um, you know, honestly, if you just soak mung beans um, and, you know, to the point where they're sprouting uh, overnight or just, you know, all day and put them in the instant pot just with chicken broth and some cumin, um, I love them. They're so good over rice. And honestly, I'll be totally honest with you. They are, uh, they do not affect your lower intestines like lentils do. So I... And they have a lot of great things in them that most people don't get in their diet. So highly recommend them. Lots of protein, really easy to cook. And um, yeah, the the coconut curry is delicious. Uh, If anybody else has any other recipes, I know they're used in Indian cooking quite a bit. Um, I saw a recipe online for like uh, mung bean like pancakes, which seems really fascinating to me. Kind of like a, a potato pancake, but made out of mung beans. Anyway, so please link me if you have other uses for mung beans because I'm kind of passionate about them in a really strange way. They're like the, the orphan of beans. I'm like, I, it, it's kind of like when they did like a pomegranate, like rebrand. I really want to bring the mung bean back. 
Okay, anyway. Uh, and the last question today is Scruffajet asks, I heard mention of something called Star Wars Detours. And when I looked it up, I saw your name. Can you talk about it? Um, yeah, Star Wars Detours was a show that I did a voice on a couple, several episodes many years ago. Um, Seth Green was the creator of it. And it was like a comedy set in the Star Wars universe. And it was right before Lucas film was sold to Disney. And so when Disney bought uh, Lucas, they put everything that was in pretty much almost everything that was in development on the shelf because they wanted to sort of like um, re reconvene the property in a sense. So that whole show, and I think it was completely finished. It was like 3D CGI kind of cartoons. It was really beautiful, um, got shelved. So I don't know if one day they'll release it. I know a lot of famous people are in it. Um, it was really funny and it was written by Seth and, um, a bunch of other people that I know and they really love Star Wars. So I think it was, you know, maybe just brought too broadly comedic in the universe, but I don't know. I'm hoping that it gets released one day. Um, there are a lot of projects that I work on and they don't get released um, or they never get made. And that's just Hollywood, guys. That's what you sign up for if you are an artist. And um, that's what if you keep at it, uh, you will get through it. That's what I tell myself every week. Um, most of the people who... I started acting class with um, a long time ago are not in the business anymore. They moved on. And so in a, in a, in a sense, you got to stick around um, because it is hard and most people do quit and it's okay to quit. Um, I'm not there yet, but it, if one day I'm like, this is not fun anymore and I don't really care about the result, I'm going to be out of there and that's fine. Um, but if you're an artist, just you have to be rejected. And the thing to remember is always do the art that you have to do, regardless of whether you're going to be rejected or not, because we have little time in this world to be an artist. Don't always take your cues from what other people will approve of. Do the stuff that's in your heart, too. Um, and on that note, I will see you guys in a couple weeks, okay? Um, I'll have some good announcements and some fun times. All right. See you later. Bye.